All right, hello. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Welcome to my live stream. And tonight we are going to continue with the Japanese giant hornet pollen painting um, and making her look nice and pretty. And so last week I spent a lot of time on the head, which is the way I like to uh, start a lot of projects. I don't know why, it's just, I guess is where my head is at. So tonight I thought I was gonna start working on the uh, poly painting the thorax and hopefully getting to the abdomen because there's some nice pretty stuff going on there. Let's take a quick look at my reference. These are pictures that I gathered from Google searches. And uh, if we zoom in here on the thorax, this, this, this section right here, got some really nice pretty colors here. Uh, definitely some dark blacks and browns and then orange and yellow spots back here. I uh, probably have to find a few more references uh, just to make sure I have enough. But you can see these patterns right here. And of course, there's a lot of fuzziness as well, but we'll get to that in a later point. Just to, you know, look at a few more things, making note of the, um, making note of the colors on the legs. Kind of talked about this a little bit last week. You can see sort of you know, dark and, and lighter spots. I don't really see the back legs in this picture very well. You can see sort of darkness right here and then a light color right here around the joint. So common thing with insects. This is another, here's a, here's a good example. Darkness right here. And then we see like a, an orange spot right here and here. <clears throat> Why does that pigmentation occur? I do not know. But uh, a lot of the times it's uh, markers, like identifying markers. It probably changes from individual to individual depending on the species, but there we go. Real quick, just to make sure everything is working. And so what I'm gonna do is since this is predominantly a dark color, I'm going to uh, fill it with so this matching dark color from here. So I'll just uh, maybe roll over like around here and press C. That'll be one way to sample the colors. <clears throat> and then I'm going to establish this with going to um, let's say color. Also, let's make sure. Usually, when you fill it, fill an object with a color, it automatically turns polypaint on. So you can see polypaint is not currently on but if I go in here and say fill object see how it automatically turns on now we're good to go with poly painting <clears throat> and so another thing I like to do let me uh, scroll this down a little bit is you know it's kind of a mixture of blacks and browns here with browns in the edges here so I'm going to do a little bit of masking which is one of my favorite tricks when poly painting is to play with masks. So I just put off this off to the side here. Let's just put it down here. So this is a pure ref that I'm using right here in this my, for my reference window, which is one of my favorite reference programs. It's very convenient, you can stick it down here. That'll work. And turn on the solo button for a second. And just go down here to uh, masking. Let's do let's do a cavity mask. I'm gonna set the intensity to 100, and it's a little bit subtle, but you can kind of see it there. If you can't see the the uh, if the material is making it hard to see the colors, sometimes I'll temporarily switch to say the flat material. This one right here, flat color, and you can see the masking there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press Control I to invert the mask. I'm gonna hide the mask by pressing Control H, and then I'm gonna pick an absolute dark, dark, dark black, and let's do color fill object. Whoops. I think actually what I wanna do is I don't wanna invert the mask. Let me go back a few steps. Sorry, I didn't want to invert the mask. Let's do the, uh, let's clear the mask and do cavity mask. Invert, 
hide the mask, and let's set the color to a RGB intensity down to a lower value, and I'll choose color, fill object, and just hit this a few times. So it's kind of just darkening that out and getting a little bit of detail in there. So if I switch to that flat color, you can kind of see it. It's kind of subtle. It's okay. My computer is beeping and it's throwing me off. So let's clear that mask and let's go to mask by curvature. I just like to fool around with these things and see what we can come up with. So that's going to give me some dark spots there. So I'm going to invert the mask again, hide it, and choose color, fill object, just to get some darkness in there. Just so we have a little bit of variation. I'm going to turn on symmetry across the X axis and let's get our paintbrush out. So in a paintbrush, and I'm going to set the RGB intensity to a lower value. Just pick something in a mid-range. And then I'm going to hold the Shift key. So this is my smooth brush, but I'm going to turn off Z Add because I don't want to smooth any of my detail. And I'm going to turn on RGB, maybe bring this down just a little bit. And that way this just makes it a blur brush. I'm going to Control drag and release to clear any masks. And just, you know, you brush over this, it's going to kind of add a little bit of a blur there. So now that we have that, I'm just gonna go in here and start painting maybe a black color in some of these spaces here. So this is a space where the, the wings come out, the wing muscles, and just kinda of add some black along the edges here. This is my sort of established base coat. kind of thing. I like to do it here within the uh, divisions between the various plates of the thorax. And then again, hold the shift key and blur. You get a nice smooth gradient. All right. And then here, this is the spot where the abdomen uh, joins the uh, joins the thorax, so maybe paint black around there a little bit. So that's pretty good. And now let's take a look. So we have these sort of triangular pieces right here, and on my reference you can see we have a nice bright yellow splotch there. So I'm going to turn off Z, uh, sorry, Solo, and use the eyedropper. I'm going to press C while hovering over this to just pick that kind of color. I might even make it a little bit brighter and turn on the solo button and then just start painting that nice sort of triangular splotch over here. You know, hold the shift key to blur that. I might hold the shift key and increase the RGB intensity. This is my uh, Thorax here is about 7 million polygons, which is not too bad. I usually keep these parts between, you know, 6 and 10 or 15 million, depending on the complexity. I'll hold the shift key and blur that a little bit. Let's get a little bit of orange in there. Select, press C while hovering over this orange part, and paint that in there. Can hold the shift key and just do a little bit of blurring here. And there we go. Then we have yeah, so this right here, if we take a look at this piece, this is a cool little piece. You see a lot of uh, on Hymenoptera bees and wasps and stuff. So let's take a quick look over at the wings here so we can see what I'm talking about. I give these things stupid names. Oops. 
Okay, where's my thorax? Solo button, duh. Okay, I don't know if I actually need that piece, but in any case, what this is is this is like you know a little shield over the where the wings come out of the thorax, and it's kind of like a little shoulder plate. If you think of like plate armor. A little bit surprised I don't have it, but I did not make it yet. So I guess this is unfinished, but we'll make that in a bit. But anyways, let's go back to the thorax and won't worry about that later. Uh, like I say, I started making this model like last year and then I got busy with other projects so it's been a little bit neglected. I thought it was completely finished but I think I still have some work to do on it. Um, then we have this sort of piece down here which has got some orange in it. Here you get some reds in here too. Yeah, it looks nice. This is why I usually do a lot of my, when I'm doing my diffuse passes or, you know, base color or whatever you want to call it, I do a lot using poly paint and ZBrush just because the brushes are so nice to use for this kind of thing. Um, and they have such nice tablet sensitivity. And also I'm just used to them. If I try and do, you know, I, I what I'll do is um, a lot of times, and like I mentioned this last week, is I'll, I'll do a really nice painting, poly painting as, better, as good as I can within ZBrush and then export my high and low res models. So my high res model will probably be like something decimated. My low res model will have UVs. Bring that into something like Substance or Marmoset and then I'll just use the uh, paint brushes in that, those programs to kind of finish the painting but I'll also use them to create things like curvature and ambient occlusion and normal and that kind of stuff. So usually out of ZBrush, I'll create my displacement maps and my um, displacement and texture maps. And I use uh, programs like Substance or Marmoset to create all, all the other maps, including normal maps. The normal maps in ZBrush are just not that great, sorry to say. There used to be a little plugin called X Normal way back in a million years ago that we all used for making um, normal maps in ZBrush. It was a really great plugin, but it was a bit too complicated, and so they replaced, they simplified it. And in doing so, it kind of lost some of that really nice uh, ability to make normal maps in ZBrush. So there's not a whole lot of painting that needs to be done on the thorax because it's largely black and brown with just little spots here and there of orange and red. So adding a little bit of red here and then holding the shift key to smooth that out. Let's go over here to this part so it looks like we have basically kind of these lobes here on this section. We have two splotches and then a black line down the middle. So I'm going to just fill in some red here real quick just to kind of get that shape defined how I want it. Let's sample some orange. Hold the shift key to blend these things together. And one of the things that I'm always amazed about when doing insects <coughs> is um, how symmetrical the colors often are, especially on things like wings. If you look at a butterfly wing, you know, the patterns are symmetrical across the range, not perfectly symmetrical. I'm painting them perfectly symmetrical now, but as I mentioned before, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go back later and then turn off symmetry and then just kind of change one side just slightly to make it more realistic you know just the overall shape of these colored splotches to make it look more interesting and, and more natural here we go is that easier to see hopefully that works a bit better 
to the situation where two monitors aren't enough. Okay. Alrighty. And so, uh, point being that um, I'm always amazed at how symmetrical it is because, you know, remember that these are organisms, so they're made up of living cells. And these cells, you know, as as the animal develops, you know, they differentiate and the animal grows. You have the bilateral symmetry. So if you have a one butterfly or wasp or whatever fly wing on one side and the other on the other side, so you've got this cell over here and this cell over here, how do the pigments understand to be the same color on either side, being so separated as they are? That's one of those things that I just find absolutely fascinating about uh about biology, you know. When I say no, you know, it's always it's a little bit teleological, but uh, you know, it's still really interesting that you have this kind of symmetry in pigments, even on parts of the on parts of the organism that are so far apart. And then, of course, uh, I see a lot more red in here, so I'm going to bring some red back in I'm gonna get like a nice deep dark red so I'll just switch colors here and just go in here and maybe I'll lower the RGB intensity and this might be a good place for instead of doing this stroke type I'm gonna do color spray I should put the reference over here is fine and go into the stroke and I'm going to set the color slider all the way to zero that reduces you know if this is all the way at one then that means it's going to each one of the little colored dots if I bring this up to 100 we're going to have a lot more variation see how we're getting that rainbow color in there that's because this this refers to the randomization of color so I don't want that so I'm going to undo that I'm going to set this color to zero so I only get the one color there and let's bring in an alpha, maybe just like a tiny little dot. And just go in here, just paint, just in certain little areas. This is going to be fairly subtle because, like I've said, when you uh, when you start to add a shader, like if I render this in, in Redshift for Maya or whatever, you know, with all the subsurface scattering that I intend to put into this to make it look more realistic, it's going to make the colors a little bit you're going to lose a little bit of that color in the in the base color, the diffuse or whatever. So uh, for that reason, you want to kind of exaggerate a little bit here in ZBrush. Of course, you can always pump it up with a node or something like that in your Hypershade network. Let's do this just around the edges here. Yeah, that looks good. I like that. Let's go in here and do another cavity mask. Let's try mask by smoothness. Nah, it's a little bit subtle. I'm going up the range. Mm. Peaks and valleys, that's a good one. There we go. Mask by peaks and valleys. So I'm going to invert that mask. Press H and get just a dark, almost black. Just go over this one more time. Just to bring in some of those details again. A little bit of smoothing. It's kind of nice, I should say blurring rather than not smoothing. So sometimes what I'll do is, I'll keep the mask on, but I'll hit, that, hit it with a blur brush and you can see how it kind of even though the mask is kind of protecting some areas, you still get that blurring will kind of soften it up a little bit, make it look very organic. So just taking advantage of all the stuff that I've already sculpted, so that I have to go in here and do the same work twice.
is pretty cool. What I'm going to do is I am going to add a little bit more reference here because I've only got a few images of the thorax. So I'm going to do a quick Google image search for Vespa and uh, India. And look at some more images here. Drag these in off the internet. You can see the little splotches there. That one's very, very dark. So you see this one is obviously dead. You can see as they die, the colors decay a bit. It looks a little bit nasty. So uh, that's why, you know, I think it's always nice to try and use pictures of live live ones as much as possible. It's the same thing when you're trying to sculpt them. If you're using a lot of references of dead insects, they tend to get really shriveled. And so it can be misleading in terms of, of what you're trying to get in terms of the shape, especially something like a fly. Um, So, I mean, it looks like, you know, for the most part, the, the thorax is just mostly a dark color. Let's add this little piece in here so that we have uh, we have everything we need. So I'm going to move this off. Well, let's do this. All right, so let's see what's going on. Yeah, so let's turn off the solo button for a moment. And I have this right here, which was an experiment that kind of failed. Let's get rid of that. I'm just trying to do some kind of background. So I'm going to get rid of that. So long. And of course, it's never a bad idea when you're deleting things to remember to save. So I'm just choose save next. <clears throat> Well, that's doing that. And shout out to my sponsor, which is beer and leftover Halloween candy. Great combination. Um, okay. So I'm going to turn a few things off. Don't need to see the stinger. Um, you know, I always forget about this feature, but it's a really great one because it's a newer feature. Let me move my uh, re reference out of the way. It's these buttons right here. Um, and what these are is that these are visibility presets. So in other words, this V1 is a preset. So let's turn everything on for V1, right? So we don't have to go back and keep turning things on and off. And then I'm going to click on V2. And now what I can do is maybe let's turn on. I'm going to turn everything on. Try and turn everything on. There we go. All these different folders. Right, so let's turn off the abdomen. Let's turn off the stinger. Let's uh, go up to legs. Don't really need them. Okay, all right, so, okay. My mouse keeps disconnecting. I don't know why. There we go. Um, so, okay, point being is I have this preset now, which is everything visible. And then this preset, V2, which is the wings, the thorax, and the head. 
So if I want to do like a third that maybe has just the, uh, the head and let's say the abdomen. All right, so I have these nice little presets. Now I don't have to go and hunt through all these subtools anymore. I can just switch between presets. So let's go into V2 here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little piece that goes right here that covers the opening where the wing joins the body. And of course I forget what that's called. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna append a polymesh star Press W for the gizmo. I'm gonna click here so this centers it. Oops. Make sure we have the right subtool. And let's just get ourselves a nice little polysphere. Doesn't have to be terribly fancy. And squish it down like this. And squish it down like this. It's kind of a, like an upside down tear shape in a way. So let's get out the old move brush. That's not a move brush. Add for our smooth brush here. And lift it up like this. Now the wings are kind of in an unnatural position here just because of the way I was modeling, modeling them. And so um, I'm going to ignore that for the moment while I'm putting this in here. And let's just hide the wings. I just want to use some reference for the basic scale. And this is nice because, wow, modeling uh, insect wing muscles is tough, mainly because the references are few and far between, especially for very specific species. So having this little blocker here makes my life a little bit easier, allows me to be a little bit, I don't want to say lazier, but maybe it should be lazier when it comes to modeling the wing muscles. So I'm going to hit Control D to divide this a few times. Um, and then let's take a look. I'm going to use my one of my favorite brushes, which is TWSK cloth. So the SK cloth, the SK stands for uh, Sakuri. Ah, right, damn it! I can. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to pronounce his name correctly. Sakaki. I always like to shout out to Sakaki Kuro. Kuro, I can't pronounce his name right, and I apologize. Uh, just because he has these wonderful brushes, the SK Pack, I highly recommend them. This SK Cloth is one of my favorite brushes, same with the clay fill. Um, so go to his Gumroad, download those brushes, and install them. I absolutely love them. Can't recommend them enough. Just, you know, I use the, the Damien Standard brush for years, which I still do. It's a wonderful brush. I got no problem with that. But I find for creating these lines, there's just such a, such a gentleness to this particular brush. It just works so well. I'm going to temporarily turn on my uh, blue material just because it's easier to see. 
and kind of exaggerating the uh, the details here, but it's okay. I can now come back with this. And I'm using the clay tubes brush here, kind of like sandpaper, just to help shape the surface. I have a low Z intensity on it, and uh, I find that's really helpful. A lot of times it's just a matter of finding the shapes, using the brushes. This one's pretty straightforward, though. Got kind of a dip right here. And just smooth it out a bit. I'm going to control click on this just to um, store my undo history and then I'm going to do a cool, quick Z remesh just to make the geometry follow the surface a bit better. So I'll go Z remesh and let's just do half. A few seconds there. times actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to adaptive let's set the polygon count to like 25,000 actually let's do 5,000 does this speed things up a little bit there we go. Let's move this a little bit. And you know, with uh, as I mentioned before, you can get away with a lot with insects in terms of topology because this piece isn't going to deformed, isn't going to deform. It's just going to. I just want this to be a little bit efficient. I also think about you know a topology that's going to make it easy to create UV texture coordinates for it. So something like this is fine. Is it the best topology in the world? No, but it should work out. Just, just fine for what we need. I'm going to hit Control D a few times, and then go up in here and project history. Project, project history. I don't care about coloring at this point. Let's turn off color there, so we we'll get that message all the time. There we go. Pretty simple, but looks nice and organic. Uh, let me divide a couple more times because I do want to get some of these details in here like I have here. So for that, maybe what I'll use is uh, Damien Standard Brush. Let's get this out of the way here real quick. And um, let me use Drag Dot. Let's bring up the Z intensity a little bit. Get a nice kind of that kind of quality. And this cake cloth again, just to give this a little bit more of an edge. Then I think the last thing we do here, sculpting wise, is go in here to um, surface noise and let's frame this real quick. And I'm just going to add just a little bit. Oops. Bring up the noise scale. Z 
doesn't have to be much. Let's see, if I do um, apply to mesh, that's not bad. I'm gonna smooth it out just a little bit so it doesn't look too bad. And then, just as a quick trick, I'm gonna go up here to geometry and hit it with a clay polish. And that's gonna leave a little bit of a mask. It's kind of subtle. I'm gonna invert this, but you can see a little bit of a residual mask there. Um, and I'm gonna use that with, say, something like an inflate brush, just to hide the mask here, just to bring out some detail here, just some kind of cool organic kind of detail. So when you use that clay polish option, what it does is it's it's like hitting the entire surface with a clay brush, sorry, a polish brush all at once, right? So it tends to, it's great for when you're doing kind of like semi-hard surface, semi-organic stuff because it tightens everything up and cleans things up, but it also leaves this residual mask and a lot of times I'll invert that mask and then go over with an inflate brush just to kind of bring out some of these micro details. And this is the kind of stuff that looks really nice when you you get a nice specular map. I mean, this is such a tiny piece of, piece of the wasp that it's gonna be pretty subtle, but sometimes subtlety is the whole point. So I'm gonna clear that mask and get the uh, move brush here and just curve it a little bit more. All right, so that's looking pretty good. I think my mouse has got problems. Yes, it does. The mouse has problems. So I'm just gonna unplug it and plug it in. It's a wireless mouse, I think the batteries are dead or something like that. I don't know. Um, let's set that back to the white color here. I'm gonna select a dark, maybe a darkish red, and do color, fill object. And then I'm gonna select a black here, so I'm just hovering over a black portion, pressing C to sample that color. And I'm gonna do like another quick cavity mask. Invert that mask and fill the object. Just so I get a little bit, so it's not just flat black or flat red, it's got a little bit of, uh, a little bit of both in there. I'm going to clear that mask and select a lighter red. Let's go back to the paintbrush and just hit it real quick with some of this. So you can see how that, yeah, the detail is going to look pretty nice. And smooth it a bit, or sorry, blur it. I think in some of the other reference, let's see here real quick. See in this one, you can see a little bit of orange. So this is a piece that I've been just been modeling. It's just a little like, I uh, think of it like a, if you're thinking of like plate armor on a knight or something, it'd be like the shoulder plate or something or a soldier or whatever. Um, just gonna arrange these real quick. Let's take a look at some of the other reference. Here it's got a little bit of red on there, kind of like that. This is gonna vary from one individual to the next. This one's got some red. This one, mostly black. This right here, that's this part right there. So you can see how the, uh, the muscles are coming out there of the wing. Let me just look at a couple more. So it looks like the consensus, oh, this one has more, I think this is the one I was originally looking at. So this has a brighter orange on it. And I kind of like that. So once I find what happened to my Cintiq pen here, oops, it's saving the project, so. Thank you, ZBrush. Um, let's turn off solo for a second. And I'm gonna select some of this orange color. Go over here. Let me turn it 
I actually love polypinning quite a bit. My two favorite parts of any project are sculpting details and polypinning. Just because I like details a lot. I appreciate very simple artists who do very beautiful, elegant, but simplified um, artwork. But when I do my own artwork, I tend to go straight for detail. I don't know what that says about me. <clears throat> Same thing with music. You know, if I listen to, to what they call classical music, I tend to listen to Baroque, Johann Sebastian Bach, that kind of stuff. Very intricate, lots of details. It's just kind of the way that I am. I'm also the person who, if somebody refers to Bach as being classical music, I had to remind them that technically it's Baroque. Classical came after Bach. That would be your Mozarts and stuff. Okay. Let's see, that's kind of cool. Maybe a little bit yellow on this leading edge right here. There we go. And of course, the other thing we need to do is duplicate it. So I'm going to get my friend the gizmo. Do a little bit of positioning here. And Save. Let's do file. Save next. All right. Itching my chin. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay. Uh, Z plugin. Subtool master, mirror. Uh, I'm going to merge into one subtool across the X axis. Yes, thank you very much. There we go. So now I have it on both sides. Oh, I'm sorry, it's reconstructing. There we go. Oh, I forgot I had my. 3D mouse here. All right. So now what I think I'm gonna do very quickly, I'm gonna alt click here on my thorax again, and just very quickly go in here and kind of start to desymmetrize this. So I turned off symmetry here, and uh, maybe I'll select uh, dark black, blackish red, and go in here and Alright, what's the problem here? RGB, RGB intensity. Oh, sorry, I had a mask applied. That'll do it. Okay, so I'm going here and just. For this kind of thing. Just so it's not so symmetrical. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, hopefully everybody saw the ZBrush announcement today. If you didn't, it is on YouTube. You can check it out. 
So they basically, Paul and Louis and O'Fair went over the new features in ZBrush 2024. So it looks like a lot of really cool features in there worth checking out. Of course, it's always entertaining to watch Louis and Paul and O'Fair do their banter while explaining the new features. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the beta this time around, which is nice, so I got to try these out. I can say it's, they're really solid. Uh, some of my favorite features include the repeat to other parts. So if you have, let's say, and I just, you know, when I was playing around with the beta, I did this character. I took a break from doing bugs and I did a character, this vampire queen. And so I gave her this really elaborate headdress and on the headdress, I made all these gems, hundreds and hundreds of gems using the insert mesh brush, right? So they're just duplicates of the same geometry. So one of the cool features is like, you can repeat something to all the other, you know, within a sub tool, all the other geometry, as long as the topology is, is the same, it matches, right? So in other words, I decided maybe I didn't like the particular gem that I was using or maybe the size so I could just mask all of them except for one, make changes to one, and then say repeat to others, and then it looks through everything in the subtool. Define the pieces of geometry that have the matching topology, and it applies that change to those. So it means that you can make changes really, really quickly. And it's true for poly painting as well, and other details. So I found that really useful, especially if you're trying to create iterations. If you've laid down like 100 bolts or something like that on a spaceship, and your art director says, I don't like the style of bolt you used. You can fix it in just a couple minutes, which is really nice. Okay. Some new masking features, which are worth checking out. They made some improvements to the anchor brushes. That's also pretty cool. Um, some hard surface stuff. Now, the other thing that was cool was even though this is not a new feature of 2024, I did do my renderings entirely within ZBrush using Redshift, so Redshift for ZBrush. That was really neat because I didn't have, I did everything in ZBrush 2024 and I didn't leave anything on, uh, on that. Hold on a second, I have a question on YouTube, so I'm gonna put it on YouTube real quick. Okay, so the question is, um, does poly paint have color layers like Photoshop substance or is all the poly paint combined in one layer? It's a good question and I'm going to answer it with some caveats. The first thing I'm going to do is save after this finished auto saving. I'm going to save it again. You can use 3D layers for poly paint. However, I have found that this can be, excuse the pun, a little bit buggy. So I would say use for with caution. Um, just because I've noticed that when you use 3D layers for poly paint, sometimes it can cause everything to freak out. So I'll do a quick demo here. Let's do one a demo on a different model. 
just so it's a little bit more obvious. The other thing is, is that, um, so there's a couple things I want to demonstrate here because it's a really good question. One is the layers, the other is a little known poly painting trick, which is poly painting actually does have um, modes like multiply, uh, screen, and that kind of thing. They're fairly simplified, but they can be really useful sometimes. So I'm just taking a sphere here and I've divided it up to about 1.5 million polygons. Let's move this off to the side. And I'll hit the draw button. <clears throat> so, if I go into the tool palette and into layers, right? So these are my 3D layers. And generally these are used to create shape changes in sort of a non-destructive way. So they're kind of like a very advanced morph target or if you come from another 3D program, you can think of it as kind of like a blend shape kind of thing. But essentially they work like this. I have my sphere and I'm gonna add a new layer, right? So you can see I have a layer here and it's in record mode. So if I go in here and take the move brush and make a change, right? Shape change. I don't change the topology, I keep the topology the same. Then I can use this layer to go kind of morph between the uh, unchanged version and the changed version, right? And I can even go in the negative direction. So let's uh, let's get rid of that. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna delete all. I just do bake all. Okay. Um, but you can also use these for poly paint. So if I go in here to my sub tool, and I've got poly paint turned on here, and let's fill this with dark red and then I'll go back down here to my layers and I'm going to create a new layer and instead of making a shape change I'm going to go in here and paint some colors on here right and I'll blur them right and if I choose my slider here you can see I can fade that on and off or turn it off, turn it back on, bring it all the way up to 100%. And I'm gonna hit a new layer, another layer. And this time let's uh, let's do some green so it's nice and obvious. I'll paint some green on there and with a blur brush to mix it in. All right, let's create another layer and I'll make this yellow. You get the idea. So now I can use these sliders to fade on each poly paint layer. And if I go into, I don't know if it does anything, it can go in the opposite direction. It's like you would think it might go to the opposite side of the color wheel, but no, it doesn't. But so that works pretty well. But I have noticed in the past that sometimes it freaks out, for lack of a better term, and you get this weird kind of speckly bizarroness that is hard to fix or sometimes impossible to fix even when you delete the layers. So I would say use poly paint with layers with caution. They may have fixed the bug, but I know I'm not the only one that's noticed this. I've seen a few people give lectures and they had similar issues. So I tend not to use this feature that much, but I don't know, maybe it's because of paranoia, but I would say, you know, give it a try. And of course, if I want to freeze all of these, I'll just say bake all, and now the layers are all baked on to my model. So the next thing I wanted to demonstrate was this idea of, of blending modes and how do you get to the blending modes for poly paint. So I've got my paintbrush here. Let's switch this back to freehand and turn off the alpha just so I have, you know, something like this. Okay. And if I go into the brush palette, let's dock the brush palette really quickly. And I'm gonna go down here to, I forget where it is, but it's down here somewhere. Modifiers. Uh, that's the problem, it's always hard to remember exactly where these, alpha and texture. Yes, alpha and texture, okay. Alpha and texture, this poly paint mode slider, very innocuous, but if I hold the control key, you can see it says, this will set how the poly paint is being applied with this brush. So we have several numbers here. There's five modes and they go in order. Standard, colorize, multiply, lighten, and darken. So if I set this to uh, 
bleh, one, two, three, that should be multiplied. So polypoint paint mode, I set this to three, and let's choose like a dark green. And now you can see that it's multiplying as opposed to the standard color. If I set this to two, that's gonna be colorize. So you can see I'm getting a different effect there. If I set this to four, I believe that is lighten. So I'm not changing the color, just the mode. And then the last one is darken, which is similar to multiply. I mean, similar in effect to multiply. So that's a really cool thing that every once in a while is a, is a great feature. I always forget that it's there, but there's every once in a while, when I do remember, it comes in super handy. So those are a couple ways that you can uh, deal with uh, poly painting and colors in, uh, in ZBrush. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, now the other thing you gotta remember is uh, if you're done with it, set your poly paint mode back to one. I forgot to do that the other day. I was going nuts trying to figure out my brush wasn't working. And then it was kinda like, duh, I forgot. This is one of those things like um, if you have a custom interface, right? Um, what you might want to do is uh, go in here to preferences, config, config, enable customize, and this is a good one. I'm going to hold control and shift, sorry, control and alt, and drag this slider down here so I always have it available. And then I'll go preferences, turn off, enable customize, store config. The next time I start up ZBrush, this poly paint mode slider will be right there. That's a great one to have handy because otherwise you have to dig around. You can see I always forget which menu it's in. So uh, we got a little bit of a block out of the colors on the thorax. Let's move on to the abdomen, otherwise known as the gaster. For those of you who are really into entomology terminology, let's turn this folder on and. Go all high. Oops. Some tool. All high. And I'm gonna take a little break. Have a little swig. Get down tonight. Um. And let's take a look at our reference. So much like a bee, we've got, and as cruel as this is, we've got alternating dark and yellow uh, stripes. And you can see some beautiful variation here in the pigmentation, some wonderful you got reds, and then this blurring and bleeding. I just absolutely love it. I love that stuff. Um, and then we get a side view here. You can see... In this case, it's like the stripe. Again, here's another ex example of something that I just absolutely love in biology. You know, this tour guide, this plate here is completely separate from this one, right? Yet the colors continue in this line to complete that kind of striping effect. It seems to be fairly consistent among individuals. Yeah. There might be more black and less yellow on some. Excuse me. And as I mentioned before, it might look darker if it's an older insect. I, well, that's true with ants. I don't know about these guys. Maybe they get lighter as with age. It's hard to say. Um, okay. That's the basic idea. All right, and so let's sample a dark color. Press C. And this is several different pieces here. So we have, this is the top, right? So we're gonna isolate that. And I got it up to 25 million because I went overboard on this one. Um, let's do color 
fill object. Ooh, maybe did I already paint this? No. Is there a mask applied? Maybe. Interesting. Maybe I did paint it at one point. Anyways, sorry, I'm starting to mumble. I apologize. Um, so I'm going to take a, a slight break here to do a little bit of plugging. Um, I want to plug ZBrush Jewelry Workshop real quick. This is a company that I've founded with Tomas Wittelsbach. And the whole point of it is we teach jewelers how to use ZBrush. That's something I'm into. And actually, I made a really nice, um, uh, let's see, a brooch using the same model here. If I go to my website, I'll show it real quick. So this is actually a brooch that I made for a friend of mine commissioned it. So it's the same model. I simplified it to make it more stylized. And um, you can see with the patina that's applied to the silver. So this is sterling silver really brought out the details in the wings really nicely. And so if you're curious about how to make things like this, maybe you know ZBrush, but you want to get into jewelry, check out ZBrush Jewelry Workshop. Um, we have a membership. Now, if you're not sure if you want to, you know, if, if you're just curious, uh, I also have some courses on Udemy. I have three courses that I recently put up there. These are also for jewelry designers, but they're beginning ZBrush uh, uh, courses. So you can, if you're not a Z, uh, if you're not interested in jewelry, but you want to learn some basic ZBrush, I think they're also work. I just use jewelry as an example. So the three courses is basically I have one which is a fundamentals, which basically teaches all the basic fundamentals in about 15 chapters or about 15, 20 minutes each. And then I have uh, another course which I created. This one's called Understanding ZBrush Geometry. And I created this course because I get a lot of questions about when do I use DynaMesh? When do I use ZRemesh? What's NanoMesh? So in the, each chapter in this course, I go over a different type of ZBrush geometry, whether it's um, the parametric objects, the 3D objects, subdivision surfaces, um, ZModeler, um, DynaMesh, ZRemesh, projection, and so on. So it's all the different things you know, each chapter is fairly self-contained, you know, Decimation, Sculptures Pro. And it just focuses on that one item to kind of help demystify how to use them and when to use them. And I also intersperse various pro tips here just to uh, kind of give a bit more context. And so it's about 29 chapters. So you can check that out. And then the other one that I did, um, the last one in this trio of uh, tutorials is... Uh, how to sculpt a printable violin from start to finish. So the idea behind this was it's mostly a focus on using Z modeler. And um, what I did was I, I wanted to create a, I used a violin as a topic because I just think it's a, a nice approachable um, thing to talk about. As we're all familiar with what a violin is. And I used Z modeler to kind of block it out and all the various different parts. And you can see this goes all the way from you know just a couple of polygons to the finished product and then including fine details whoops sorry about that um and but the end result is not just a violin but it's something that is printable and castable so even though it's made up of various different parts i show you how to combine everything into a single part and then make it a watertight surface so that it can actually be uh, exported and printed. So just a quick little plug there for some of the, th some of the stuff I have online. So check out udemy.com, look up my name, Eric Keller, and you'll see these, uh, you'll see these tutorials there. And uh, so far they've been getting a really nice response. I'm gonna add more soon, just as, just as I get around to it. Um, but those are worth checking out. And if you're curious about, you know, ZBrush Jewelry Workshop, uh, but you're not ready to make a commitment, I say suggest checking out these on udemy.com and you'll get an idea of my teaching style. And then you can check out ZBrush Jewelry Workshop and see if you want to dive in because this is a really interesting. Um, it, it's more than just a bunch of tutorials. It's an entire community. 
and uh, we have a Discord channel, and you get to meet me and Tomas, and we have critique sessions and office hours and all that kind of good stuff. So check that out, and let's get back to poly painting my Hornet. And thanks for indulging me on that. And let's get back to this. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got a dark color in there and let's take a quick look here and we can see that it looks like the front we're going to go yellow dark yellow it's a little bit off but for the most part let's start with this first turgite make it yellow dark yellow that would be this one right here this is a good case where I have polygroups on here and as I'm painting I don't want my colors to spill over from one turgite to the next so I'm going to go into brush under auto masking. I'm going to turn on mask by polygroup. That way, if I start painting a line on here, you can see how it stops. It doesn't bleed onto this one because it's a different polygroup. And likewise, you can do, do that kind of thing. So that's kind of a nice way to work. Again, it emphasizes why poly painting is, or polygroups rather is such a useful part of ZBrush. So I'm going to go in here, maybe do like, uh, let's do, not that one, let's do this alpha, just to have kind of a soft brush, and then I'm going to bring down the RGB intensity a little bit. That's too much. I'm just going to start blocking out where the colors are going to be. yellow I'm going to go in here and set my placement a little bit lower. That means that each dot in the color spray is going to be a little bit closer together. So I think that will look nice. switch colors here and get dark dark red just to go along the edges Let's bring down the RGB intensity a little bit just along the border here to get a nice blur Itches. Um, so another trick I like to use here. I'm going to switch to the freehand real quick, and an alpha. And I just want to show you another way to kind of create variation in a brush. Like if I have my standard stroke here, let's set the RGB intensity up to 100, and select this. So just a quick demonstration here of what I want to do. If I draw here, you can see I have a nice straight line, right? As you might expect. Um, I'm going to go into the brush palette and under orientation I'm going to increase the spin rate and increase the spin center and this is going to create kind of like a little wobble or curly cue effect. The more that I move the spin center kind of like think of the spin center as this is the center of the alpha. If I increase the spin center I'm moving the alpha the uh, center of that alpha farther and farther away and at the same time I'm making it rotate around so I get little curly cues, right? Little squigglies. This is a great way to create cool designs. So what I like to use this for is I'm looking right here at kind of like the border edge of these colors here and I kind of want to get that kind of little wobble in there. So I'm going to undo this 
stroke a few more times. It's kind of slow. And lower my RGB intensity. And maybe select that, that yellow color. And I'm gonna go back to my color spray and this alpha and then I'm going to set my stroke. I know there's a lot going on here, but this is just a result of screwing around with these things and seeing what you get to get different types of brush strokes, right? Even within just a regular paintbrush. So now I can kind of like, I'm getting a, a, you know, a paint stroke, right? But it's still, it's also at the same time, it's just a little bit wobbly. It's not perfect. There's also a few other ways you can do this. I, I, I like playing with this sometimes. And just nice little spray paint and maybe uh, increase the placement a little bit yeah something like that and then just go along here and then I'm going to turn off symmetry for a second so I can make the design asymm asymmetrical and letting that blend from the orange to the red to the yellow again I think that looks really cool Another thing you can do, kind of set this to like a darker red again, and I'm going to choose switch color, and I'm going to turn on gradient. What gradient does is it's going to blend these two t colors together using that alpha, and that's another way you can get some kind of a cool organic kind of look to your uh, paintbrush. There's even some more advanced settings where you can blend two different alphas together. Uh, that's a newer feature, I always forget about that, but it's a pretty cool one. If you go into the brush, for, sorry, the alpha palette, and under modify, is it modify? Maybe it's under the brush, let's go under brush. Sorry, it's under brush, alpha and texture. You can actually blend two different alphas depending on um, the transition which I believe is brush pressure so if I go in here and say this one right, and then vary my brush intensity it's gonna choose blend between those two alphas depending on how, how hard I'm uh, pressing on my tablet that's kinda cool it's a lot of stuff in ZBrush there's no doubt about it there was a time where you know, I taught the 10 week intro to ZBrush course at Noman for many, many years, which is always fun. Um, but when I started doing that, which was a long time ago, like I'm talking about around the era of ZBrush 3, you could teach the entire program in 10 weeks. Um, you could actually teach all of ZBrush in 10 weeks. Now, forget about it. There's just so much in ZBrush. Okay. I'm going to select some of this black here and just heat into this a little bit. Same with right here. So we got that. 
Um, I think this should look like this. Okay. Let's check the reference. It does seem to be consistent that there's two two orange stripes in this first one and a black in the middle, and two different, three different little dudes here. I think there's plenty of room for interpretation now. So on this one, a second. Now let's move on to this tour guide. I'm gonna press C and let's turn the symmetry back on, make things nice and fast. I'm gonna create these little orange splotches. It's like a Rorschach test or something. Let's do this, I'm gonna go Get a little blend of color here. So if you ever, um, you guys have probably heard about mimicry among insects, or sorry, animals in general, but insects and other arthropods exhibit this a lot. Mimicry is basically when one type of bug looks like another type of bug. And it's usually a defense mechanism. So for example, a good, a good example is there are flies that look a lot like bees and the yellow and black stripes. And um, you can usually tell if they're flies, look at the antenna, look at the number of wings. Flies have two wings. Uh, bees and wasps will have four wings. Most insects, most flying insects have four wings, the exception being flies, which are in the order Diptera. Terra meaning wing, DI meaning two. Um, so in the case of a fly that's looking like a bee, it's trying to fool predators. I mean, I'm saying, you know, it doesn't know that it's doing this. It doesn't know what it looks like. So it knows it looks like a fly, but through the course of evolution, of course, a species of fly has adapted to looking like a bee. Another example is insects that taste really bad. So there are butter, certain butterflies that taste horrible. And then there are other butterflies that don't taste as bad, but they evolve to look like the butterflies that do taste bad through, you know, natural selection. And uh, this is known as Batesian mimicry. It's named after a scientist, Bates, who I believe was a contemporary of Darwin. He's a big bug enthusiast who wandered the jungles looking for beetles and bugs, which is, that's what they did back in the 19th century. Before they had Twitter and TikTok, they went into the jungle looking for bugs. Um, so we had Bates who kind of noticed this tendency for one type of insect to mimic a bad tasting or poisonous, sorry, venomous uh, other insect. So, a little science trivia for you tonight. If this was Paul's live stream, it would be movie trivia, right? I'm just gonna shake this a little bit. Let's go back to this. Yeah, 
and let's get a little bit of red color. It's a really cool book that the um, all about insect. Uh, defenses, chemical defenses. In a minute I mentioned this, of course, I'm blanking on the title of it. I'll turn off symmetry real quick. For the Love of Insects, that's the name of the book. Let me see if I can find it real quick on Amazon, just to give my eyes a little bit of a break. This one right here. Uh, Thomas Eisner, really amazing writer and entomologist. Uh, highly recommend this book. It just goes through so many different examples of various different insect defenses from, you know, things like bee stings, which are pretty straightforward, injecting venom in, venom or like fire, uh, fire ants injecting venom into the skin to something more exotic like a bombardier beetle, which actually has explosive chemicals coming out of its butt. Um, I did an animation a few years ago that explains the science of the bombardier blue beetle. If you check out entomologyanimated.com. So this is a personal project that I've been working on for a few years, and I have a bunch of videos devoted to insect physiology. So this one right here is a uh, bombardier beetle. And I kind of did a joke at the beginning. I, I, I did this in Unreal a long time ago. It's a very old version of Unreal, so this is not as fancy as what we have now. But I made kind of a fake um, video game. Excuse me. So this is fun. So I actually animated. I did all the animation actually in Maya and brought it into Unreal. But I had to animate this bombardier beetle fighting off uh, six ants. So that was a lot of legs to animate. And obviously this is a joke because in the real world, you don't have flames shooting out of the butt of this thing. Um, I just wanted to kind of just do this as kind of a goofy gag because this would be kind of a cool or fun video game to do, you know. And then at the end, I have it fighting a, a jumping spider. And when I came up with this animation, I wasn't thinking about how many legs I'd have to animate. And then of course it comes up against the frog. So that was kind of a gag, and then I just pause it, and then I start to actually talk about the science of the bombardier beetle, and um, a little bit about the taxonomy, and then the actual internal organs involved in creating this kind of chemical defense. So this is all stuff that was inspired by that book, uh, and then, of course, a lot of other research, reading scientific papers and stuff, but actually get into the chemistry of, of how these things work. So another little plug there, thank you for indulging me. Um, but um, if you're curious what I do with all these bugs, I make little animations that explain things like how vision works and fire, fire ant venom, and that kind of stuff. And there's also some free tutorials on here, um, some overviews of some of my insect models. So rain beer scare, <laughs> rain, rainbow scarab beetle and blypigid, uh, jamselfly, so stuff like that. Check it out. Sorry, I haven't been paying attention to the questions here. It's been talking. Um, it 
Yes. If you're going to compare me to Bob Ross, I will take that as a compliment. Happy, happy blotches of orange. How many people saw Bob Ross's on Halloween? I saw a few of them. That's always a classic. I think that should be a classic. That, that to me, is even more of a better car, uh, costume than, uh, than Jason. Or Michael Myers. Michael Myers, Jason, and Bob Ross. There's a couple of blobs coming out here. And then I'm going to select some of this and tighten this up just a little bit. And then after, you know, I paint all these stripes, I'll go back in with some cavity masking and bring out some of these dots and these de details a bit more. And then, okay, so let's do this. I'm going to turn symmetry back on. Let's remember to save, shall we? How do you get good at ZBrush? Uh, never save. That way you'll have to start everything over, over and over and over again. I've done that plenty of times. I think it's millipedes that excrete either arsenic or cyanide. I think it's arsenic. We can find insects that do either. There are ants that shoot acid out of their butts. Which is really cool. There are also fire ants that when they inject their venom, that's actually an alkaloid, which is a base, which is, of course, the opposite of an acid. So I find that interesting because you can shows you the diversity of ants. You have one ant type of ant that has an acid as its primary defense chemical, and the other end of the spectrum, another ant that has a base. So another curious question of how that kind of thing evolves. And with you know with something like a bombardier beetle, it's it's not just one species. There are there are a lot of species that have variations of this type of defense, and there's a lot of different insects that also have very complex chemical compounds that they excrete, or they shoot out, or whatever. So it's it's not just something that's isolated to one particular species. Um, I mean, chemical defenses seem very exotic, of course, because, you know, human beings aren't running around shooting acid out of their butts, at least none that I know of. Um, if they are, it probably says more about what they're eating for lunch than anything else. Um, so it seems extremely exotic to have such a thing, but when you think about, you know, going all the way to single-celled organisms, you know, bacteria and that kind of stuff, then it makes sense, you know. A, a bacteria's world is almost entirely chemical. Everything that doesn't have eyes, everything it senses is through chemical responses, and everything that it does is basically, you know, through chemistry. So you just sort of take that logically forward through billions of years of evolution, and you find that, um, Chemical defenses are an oldie but a goodie. And uh, another great example is like, you know, jellyfish or any type of. Um, um, the jellyfish and corals, <clears throat> they have the little barbs in their tentacles. And basically, they shoot out tiny little uh, cellular harpoons, which then go pierce the skin. They send out thousands of these 
have little harpoons. So there's a little trigger mechanism. So when you brush against the uh, trigger, it releases a harpoon into your skin and that injects the venom. It's a very complicated mechanism, but you know, jellyfish and corals have been around for a very, very long time. So it's a very old type of mechanism. I do think that, you know, if you're an aspiring creature designer, kind of grab yourself some biology books, man. It's where you steal all the best ideas. You know, it's like you always hear people say, well, this is the insect or this is the wasp that inspired the alien from aliens. And it's true, but the, the reality is it's not just one. They took ideas from all sorts of different bugs. The wasps are huge ones, obviously, because wasps just like the alien, like a tarantula hawk wasp is known for basically paralyzing tarantulas, that's why it's called a tarantula hawk wasp, and injecting eggs into the paralyzed tarantula, and then the eggs hatch within the tarantula and they burst forth from the tarantula's chest, much like our friend, the little alien, adorable little xenomorph um, that we all love so much. You know, it's the same kind of idea. And that, you know, that parasitoid behavior, again, is found throughout arthropods. There's an ongoing war between wasps and sp spiders. They're always fighting each other. And I was reading in The Biology of Spiders, another one of my favorite books, um, how spiders, you know when something gets caught in their web, like an orb weaving spider, if it's a fly or a bee, this, the uh, spider knows to treat it differently. Like if a spider is trying to wrap up and paralyze or kill a wasp that's stuck in its web, it knows to approach the wasp differently than a fly and avoid its strain, sting, which is really cool. It shows you in a tiny little spider brain, there's still a lot going on. I think spiders are the artists of the arthropod world their medium is death. But I like spiders. Nematocyst. Thank you, Roy. That's ex exactly. Jellyfish and corals are part of groups known as nematocysts, named after their stingers, the type of stinger that they use, the harpoon. Roy knows because he's a marine biologist. He just also happens to be an awesome animator. Okay, I think I've done that one enough. Let's go back to this one here. So yeah, that mass by polygroup is making it really easy. I can be nice and sloppy and it won't get onto the other polygroup. That's a big time saver.
<clears throat> a lot of people don't know this, but Disney has been trying hard to make a movie about Darwin for many, many years now. Um, because believe it or not, Darwin, when he was younger, was actually a bit of an Indiana Jones. Um, he was famous for writing travel books before doing, you know, his heavier science books. So he was kind of like, you know, back then it was for people were really into reading travel books the same way they would watch like Anthony Bourdain, right? Or any other travel show. And so the voyage of the Beagle was essentially Darwin's version of No Reservations, Anthony Bourdain. It's very popular books and in it he details, I've read some of it, uh, a lot of his crazy adventures, especially in South America where he was basically running around with rebel gangs and cowboys and all kinds of other crazy stuff. His visit to the Galapagos was actually for him the worst part of the story because it was apparently miserable and sick the whole time. Um, So, um, many years ago, I did actually get a chance to go to the Galapagos. I went on one of those uh, National Geographic cruises, which is actually kind of fun. Except it didn't occur to me at the time that everybody else on the cruise is going to be in their mid-70s. So, kind of like hanging out with your grandparents or their friends. But it was still a lot of fun. It was a great trip, and I learned a lot. And got to see a lot of got to see boobies up close blue-footed boobies and a lot of lizards and marine iguanas it's a really cool trip but one of the um, guides on the tour had actually um, been in contact with uh, you know Darwin's family because there's still some of his family is still alive today it's descendants I should say and uh, they've always had Disney approaching them about doing some kind of movie. I don't know exactly what the movie's going to be. And, uh, I'm a little bit f afraid to find out. Hopefully it'll be good if they finally get around to making it. But And, I, you know, you see stories every once in a while pop up in the news about how they've been working on this kind of stuff. But so far it hasn't gotten very far. I'm just kind of blending colors here and playing with some ideas. Let's see how that looks. I think the corners could be, or the edges could be a bit more defined, but it's just laying down the basic shapes now. Um, I don't know why the title says Pablo. I'm not Pablo. I'm Eric Keller. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have control over that. Um, so, I don't know. Somebody send Paul Gabriel an angry message. No, he doesn't have any control over it either. Um, yeah, I think the other uh, nemesis that Darwin had was Lord Kelvin, right? If I'm not mistaken. Kelvin, was it Kelvin? I think it was. K 
Kelvin's big problem, I believe, if I remember correctly, was that he felt that Darwin's calculation of the age of the Earth was wrong because he felt like the rocks, they'd found rocks that should be cooler than they actually were. So if the, if the Earth was as old as Darwin claimed it was, then the rocks would have cooled down even more, but the rocks were at a higher temperature than you would expect. That's because Lord Kelvin lived at a time before they discovered things like radiation and uranium and that kind of stuff. Again, I could be totally making this up, but I don't think I am. I seem to remember reading about it, but it was a while ago. But I know that Kelvin and uh, Darwin did not get along. Kelvin Optical was what uh, the visual effects arm of Bad Robot. There's a, com there's a complete and total tangent. I'm totally not talking about Darwin anymore. Um, and the Kelvin that it's named after is not Lord Kelvin. But you'll notice if you watch a lot of J.J. Abrams movies that he always sneaks Kelvin in there somewhere. It's in Force Awakens. I noticed it was in Star Trek Beyond as well. I don't know what his obsession is. It's kind of strange. Let's get some red in there. Oh, Cousin Francis was a uh, big eugenics guy. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I don't know about much about his Cousin Francis. I'll have to look that up. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I heard, I've heard strange things about Hubble as well. A bit of a weirdo. They're all weirdo. Actually, one of my favorite weirdo scientists um, is Lynn Margolis. Um... She was the first wife of Carl Sagan. She was a biologist. And they split up mainly because she couldn't take Carl Sagan anymore, <laughs> which I can kind of understand. Carl Sagan, I, you love him, but the man's a bit full of himself, you know. Um, but uh, Margolis was um, a champion of... The whole idea of endo endosymbiosis. I know Ryan, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. The idea that you know um, the mitochondria of the cell are basically the descendant of a symbiotic relationship between a single-celled organism and an archaea. An archaea is another type of single-celled organism. Single sort, single-celled organism. It's not a bacteria. It's another branch altogether. This bacteria or several bacteria swallowed um, archaea and rather than digesting them they formed a symbiosis the archaea turned into this energy source for the cell known as my mitochondria which of course we have in our, all of our cells today it's one of the things that allow for single uh, for multicellular organisms to to arise because it uh, provided the cell with more energy so the cell could do more but anyways Lynn Margolis was a big champion of this theory she was a brilliant scientist, but she was a bit wacky. She was a 9-11 truther, so had some really crazy ideas and a bit of an iconoclast. Um, but definitely an interesting person and a very brilliant scientist as possible. She might have been a bit smarter than her husband, Carl. Uh, I think we're going to call this celebrity scientist gossip tonight. Let's name all the famous scientists who married their cousins.
Giuliani does not count as a scientist. Um, the, the, of course, this part is a little bit tedious. I'm not even going to finish the abdomen tonight. I mean, I, I find it fun and relaxing. I don't really think it's tedious, uh, but it might be tedious to watch. So I'm going to go in here and do a little bit of a cavity mask. Bring in some of these details. Let's invert that. I'm going to hide it, and then you can get it with a dark orange. Kind of lower the RGB intensity and just do color object just a few times just bring it in slowly looks kind of cool you know and I'm constantly painting in layers here so so that's kind of giving an overall blend here I'm going to clear that mask let's go in here and do uh, mask by curvature let's bring up the strength a little bit actually I'm going to try mask by smoothness it doesn't look that much different. Let's clear that mask. Peaks and valleys. I always like peaks and valleys. Yeah, there we go. I like peaks and valleys because you get this kind of blotchiness right here. So I'm going to invert that. And let's fill that with a darker black. All right. And clear that mask and just hit it with a blur brush a little bit. So I'm going to clear that mask. And now I'm going to go back here. Maybe, you know, a lot of this is just, you know, the choices I'm making as to how I'm doing this is just a result of doing this many, many times for many, many years. And just allowing myself the chance to play around um, with different ideas just to see what happens. And of course, that's how you build up your little trick bag of tricks. RGB intensity here. So I can bring this in. Just turn off the symmetry. You know, it's always important to experiment, not really on this, rely on the same techniques all the time or other thing. Otherwise, everything you do ends up looking the same. But there's always a good old standby. So things like cavity masking and masked by peaks and valleys and filling it with color, that's something I do all the time. And uh, it saves a lot of time and you can see how much detail you can get into the paint by taking advantage of that. So I'm just kind of shaping these blotches a little bit. The um, a long, a very, very long time ago, I took a class at Noman School of Visual Effects with Madeline Spencer, who was the teacher. And the class actually at that time focused entirely on texturing. Um, and back then, of course, we were using projection masters. So this is way back in the old days of ZBrush. But it was a fun class, and I learned a lot from, from Madeline Spencer. Madeline, you know, worked at Gentle Giant for a long time before, like, Weta. And um, so learned a lot from practical effects artists how they paint their maquettes and stuff, and took those techniques and developed them into ZBrush techniques, so layering colors and that kind of stuff. Um, she learned all from master visual effects artists, or practical artists. And uh, wrote a really good book, which I was the editor on uh, way back when, on texturing. Um, but the funny thing is that class I was in, um, with Ara, you know, Kermico, who also does a live stream here. 
Um, we became friends in that class. So it's kind of like way back when. And then a few other people. I believe one of the founders of Kitbash was actually in that class too, if I'm not mistaken. Of course, I can't remember his name right now, so. Um, yes, the uh, Signs of Life is still playing at the Griffith Observatory, and it will be playing for a long time. So if you get a chance, if you're in L.A., and you get a chance to go over Griffith, Griffith Observatory, check out Signs of Life. It's not just about Mars, but Mars is a big part of it. Um, but it's about searching for life in the in the uh, universe. I had a great time uh, working on that. I worked on it for about two years. It's one of the best projects I've ever done in terms of the, well, I think the final result I'm very proud of, but also the people I worked with had formed very good friendships with them. They're a lot of fun, a lot of good artists. A lot of a lot of Nomen alumni worked on that show too. Uh, Shane Chambers, uh, to name one, who's a really great artist, a really great creature artist. Um, but yeah, if you check it out, there's uh, I had some fun doing some scenes. I got a fly in there, a spider, but I also got to do a bunch of uh, microorganisms swimming around in a drop of water, like a tardigrade and stuff. And I got to do some planets and some space stuff and uh, a lot of fun. Um, underwater events, volcanic events, and uh, terrain at a distant planet. So it's a cool show. Cool kids will like it too, you know. It has that kind of Carl Sagan cosmos kind of feel to it. It's cool because it has a live narrator, so it's not a pre recorded narration. You actually have a guy walking around. Guy, I'm sorry. Sometimes it's an actor, so sometimes it's a man, sometimes it's a woman. But they kind of walk around and narrate it with this. It's kind of have the campfire kind of quality to it, you know, telling ghost stories and stuff. It's a really neat show. Very proud of it. It'll be playing there for a while because it was very expensive to make. Um, but if you get a chance, if you're in LA, I highly recommend it. I got to do a lot of DNA and molecular stuff in there. I traveled through a cell. So I got to do some mitochondria and uh, that kind of stuff. All right, so we're coming up towards the end here of my live stream. Let's see what we got so far. Some progress. I might work on the bottom part a little bit before the next live stream because it's going to be the exact same techniques that I'm showing here. So the next live stream I'm doing is not next week, but two weeks from tonight. Same time, 9 to 11. I forget what date that is, but it's not next week, but it's a week after that. So I'll continue with this uh, Hornet and um, gossip of famous dead scientists. Um, bring your science trivia if you got some. I appreciate, Ryan, some of your uh, science trivia in there about Darwin's evil cousin and the eugenics. That's pretty awesome. Say this real quick. I think it's you know as I develop this, I'm going to start. I'm gonna, uh, the other thing I'd like to do is uh, do some test renders here with Redshift in ZBrush, um, and then next week, well after whenever the next version 2024 comes out, I'll start using that and see if I can demonstrate some of the new features that I like. Uh, might be a bit off topic with insects, but hey, why not? Um, so come back and I hope you enjoy the live stream and hope to see you in the future ones. Um, any remaining questions before I sign off today? Let's see. I'm sleepy.
go back to uh, see the entire bug. There we go. Pretty cool. I think I have some textures in the mouth part, so that's why it looks like that. It's getting there. It's going to be a nice little bug when it's done. to finish the antenna here as well. This is a stinger right here. So obviously this is a female. I actually don't know a whole lot about this particular hornet other than, you know, what we read about in the news back in 2020 when they they were known as the murder hornets and they attacked the United States. They're basically, you know, they're called that because they attack beehives and they go through the honeycombs and eat the larva and rampage and otherwise destroy honey beehives. The honeybees fight back. Uh, and one of the techniques they use is, I believe, they raise the temperature of the hive so the honeybee can tolerate a few more degrees higher than the hornet can. So if they can raise the temperature of the hive just enough they can disable the hornet and save the rest of the hive, which is kind of interesting. So uh, I'm going to read more about that. But um, All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to sign off. Have a nice night. Wait. Mass by smoothness is not working in my 2023.2.2. Oh, interesting. Maybe it's not working in mine either. I wasn't getting much of a result on it. Um have to check that out in 2024 see if they fix that but that's a good point thanks for bringing that up all right guys see you next time same bug time same bug channel well different day